Hare Krishna devotees, we welcome you all to our virtual Sunday program. Uh, this is the Sunday program right before Janmashtami, which is tomorrow, the most auspicious appearance day of Lord Sri Krishna. And before we get into the most important festival, we are going to hear about the most important spiritual virtue with His Grace Amarendra Prabhu, who will be speaking on the subject. So, before I hand it over to him, I'll just go over our schedule quickly. We have a se the session by His Grace Amarendra Prabhu, followed by question answers, some announcements, and we will move into Narsimha prayers and Kirtan at the temple, which will be continuing until Darshan closes. So we welcome everyone for that. Here is today's Deity Darshan, and we'll probably just have a screenshot of it towards the end of the day as well. I will uh, kindly hand it over to His Grace Amarinda Prabhu to enlighten us uh, right before this amazing spiritual festival tomorrow. Hare Krishna. Is my voice audible, Prabhuji? Yes, Prabhu, very much. Okay, thank you. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Sthapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Hakadamahiyam Dadati Svapadantikam Namao Mishnupadaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharane Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschati Deshatarane Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare I offer my sincere gratitude and heartfelt um, obeisances to all the devotees of Iskon Atlanta Temple, the New Panihati Dham. Uh, my sincere gratitude to the management for kindly engaging my tongue in the service of the Vaishnavas with Hari Katha and Hari Kirtan on this day. My prostrated obeisances at the lotus feet of all the assembled Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis. Thank you for kindly joining us. Uh, we are wetting our appetite uh, for more and more Seva and more and more Krishna Katha and Kirtan to welcome the, the Lord of our life and lives, Sri Krishna, tomorrow on the most holy, uh, holy and auspicious um, occasion of Sri Krishna Janmashtami. Shri Krishna Janmashtami is the appearance day of Shri Hari, Shri Krishna. And we, being aspiring devotees of Shri Krishna, Krishna Janmashtami and Radharani's appearance, Radhashtami, apart from Mahaprabhu and Nityananda Prabhu's appearance and Prabhupada's appearance, uh, these are the major festivals for us on our Vaishnav calendar. So I really want to thank all the assembled Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis for taking some time out and coming here with your auspicious presence and blessing me with your presence. And I hope uh, by your best wishes, prayers and blessings, may the right words come at the right time in the right spirit of service. Uh, may this cleanse our consciousness, may it give pleasure to our ears and may it take us one step closer to attaining our goal, the lotus feet of Shishi Radha Madan Mohan. <clears throat> There's a very beautiful verse in the scriptures about who is that person who can be classified as being sinful. Kechit vadanti dhanahina jana jaganyaha. The word jaganya means sinful. So, who is actually sinful is the question. Kechit vadanti. Some people, some worldly minded materialistic people, they say, Kechit vadanti dhana hina jana jaganyaha. Those who are poverty stricken, they are actually sinful. Some people opine like that. What do the others say? Some say that those who are bereft of wealth, they are the ones who are sinful from past because of which a karmic cycle is bringing them to that, um, that situation. And this is just the opinion of some, uh, some class of men. While the other class of men, they say, Kechit vadanti guna hina jana jaganyaha. 
those who are uh, without a proper character, they are actually sinful in life because they have been sinful in the past. They have been born with these bad some scars or impressions from past life because of which they don't have the right uh, mindset or the right um, outlook and they don't have the right transcendental qualities. So some opine and some uh, give their viewpoint that those who are without wealth, they are actually poverty stricken or they are ultimately sinful. And some opine that those who have bad character, they are actually sinful. Kechit vadanti dhanahina janaha jaganyaha, kechit vadanti gunahina janaha jaganyaha. But what does Vyasadev, the knower, the compiler of all the Vedas, what does he opine? What is his conclusion? Vyaso vadati akhila veda purana vidnyo. After studying all the Vedas and compiling the Srimad Bhagavatam, what is the conclusion of Vyasadev? Narayana smarana hina jana jaganyaha. That those who are actually bereft of constant remembrance of Sri Hari, Krishna, Narayana, Sri Ramachandra, they are actually sinful. The greatest loss that we can incur to ourselves is not lo loss of wealth, it's not loss of um, health, it's not loss of any material possession. It is the loss of time. The time that has been given to us to remember Krishna and make spiritual advancement by focusing our mind on his lotus feet. That time is being snatched away and we are wasting it by thinking of other things. That is act, that mentality, that proclivity, that inclination is actually sinful, says Vyasadev. Very beautiful words. Kechit vadanti dhanahina jana jaganyaha. Kechit vadanti gunahina jana jaganyaha. Vyaso vadatya khila veda purana vidnyo. Narayana smarana hina jana jaganyaha. Those who are bereft of remembering the Supreme Lord, they are actually sinful. They are actually incurring sin. Because by not remembering the Supreme Lord, we are remembering something else which is materialistic and that binds us in the cycle of birth and death. So opportunities like this. Festivals outside, and at the same time, um, congregations, even if it's virtual meetings like this, it gives us a chance to speak, to sing, to read, to hear together, and help each other come out of the sinful tendency of remembering other things, and puts us back on track in our ultimate pursuit of remembering Krishna constantly. So I really want to thank um, such initiatives whether it's our Sunday Feast program, whether it's our festival class programs, whether it's our midweek program, all these opportunities of Hari Katha, Hari Kirtan and Seva, they actually keep us in tune to welcoming Krishna with the right mindset by remembering his pastimes, remembering and chanting his holy name, singing his Vaishnav bhajans, associating with the devotees, and in all ways possible, shielding our consciousness from the constant, non-stop, atrocious arrows of the material energy. So in today's discussion, we want to speak about the most important spiritual virtue. But before we get there, we have to understand the context of the most important spiritual virtue that Krishna is going to teach us. So Krishna lived in Vrindavan, which is, I'm sure we all know about Vrindavan. It's a, it's a rural hamlet, um, a settlement of uh, simple-hearted Vrajvasis. It's almost like a dairy farm with a lot of cows and simple-hearted, sober-minded, pure loving associates of Krishna. And Krishna lived there for about 10 years and 7 months. He was enjoying the love that he was being bathed with by the residents of Vrindavan to such an extent that he almost forgot what was happening outside Vrindavan. Yada yadahi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata bhirtanam dharmasya tadatmanam shrajamyaham paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya cha dushkritam dharma samsthapanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. In the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna has said that I come millennium after millennium to protect the devotees, destroy the demons, and re establish religious principles. So, one of the many reasons why Krishna came was to kill Kamsa to liberate Devaki Vasudev and so many other captives, so many others who were um, imprisoned by Kamsa. And also to establish Dharma by speaking Bhagavad Gita, 
to help the whole world. These were out of many, many reasons. This is definitely one of the prominent ones why Krishna appeared 5,000 years ago. But after coming in Vrindavan and tasting the sweet, loving, selfless, spontaneous mood of affection, Krishna completely forgot the frame of reference of his complete incarnation. Now, this could be a confusing point. How can God forget? Hmm? Our Acharyas describe Krishna works in two modes. He works under two categories. Just like in this material world, there are three modes. There's working of uh, sattva, rajas and tamas, or goodness, passion and ignorance. Similarly, Krishna also works under two modes. One is called as sarvatnyaha. That's the mode where he's the all-knowing Lord. He doesn't forget anything. He knows everything. He remembers everything. Vedaham samati itani varatamanani charjuna bhutani cha bhavishyani maam tu vedana kashchana. Krishna has said in the Gita, I know the past, present and future of every living being. So that's the mode of being the sarvadnya, the omniscient Lord. But at the same time, Krishna switches with another mode that is called as mukda. And mukda means innocent, sweet, um, form of the Lord, where he's completely, his intelligence, his all-knowing potency is eclipsed by the clouds of loving association, of loving pastimes, of the cows and the calves and the gopas and the gopis and Maya Yashoda and Nanda Baba and Balaram and Yamuna and Giriraj, the trees of Brindavan, the flowers of Brindavan, the dust of Brindavan, everything about Brindavan is like such a wonderful, love-filled, affectionate cloud which covers the son of his all-knowing potency. Therefore, he works under the mukta feature. So Krishna in Brindavan is mukta. He doesn't know what's going to happen next because that keeps the excitement of his pastimes going. Now imagine if Krishna knows everything. He knows what's going to happen next. Then why, why would he even wrestle his friends? Because he knows that I'm going to do this and he's going to do this and finally I'm going to win. But Yoga Maya, Vrinda Devi, Purnamasi Devi, they almost mask and eclipse his all-knowing potency. So Krishna can, in a very sweet, loving way, with excitement, with enthusiasm and eagerness, perform every, one, every aspect of his pastime without knowing what's going to happen. So Krishna in Vrindavan is so covered by the sweet, loving moods of his associates that he almost forgot about Kamsa and Devaki and Vasudeva and Mathura. So it so happened that Kamsa Maharaj was constantly thinking of Krishna. It wasn't out of affection and devotion, but it was out of fear. And nonetheless, the Srimad Bhagavatam describes uh, Kamad, Dveshad, Bhayat, Krodat, Yatha, Bhakti, Shware, Manaha. Whether we think of Krishna in affection, or whether we think in fear or envy, um, conjugal mood or friendship, Krishna is... Um, loving, lovingly conquered. But however, the condition is one has to constantly think. We have examples like Shishupal, who constantly thought of, thought of Krishna in envy. And he got liberated. Kamsa constantly thought in fear, but he got liberated. So one can get liberation, but one cannot get eternal service at the lotus feet of Krishna with that kind of mindset. You will definitely be free from all problems and we will be delivered from this material world. But Anukulya na Krishna Anushilanam. If we want seva at the lotus feet of Krishna, it must be favorable. It must be out of devotion. So nonetheless, Kamsa was constantly thinking of Krishna and he sent Keshi. Uh, because he told Keshi that there's a prophecy of my death in the hands of Krishna. And uh, you go and kill him. And Keshi asked, how do I recognize him? Kamsa said, it's very simple. It's that person who's most beautiful in Brindavan and who has a peacock feather and he plays a flute. And he holds on a yellow dhoti. <laughs> and it so happened that day that Krishna's best friend Madhu Mangal, he told Krishna that everyone respects you more than me. I'm a Brahmana and you're a Vaishya. They should be respecting me more than you, but they seem to worship and respect you more than they worship and respect me. And as a result, they give you more laddus than they give me. So I think the secret is all about the yellow dhoti and the peacock feather and the flute. Why don't you lend that to me? for a day. Why don't you give it to me for a day? And I'll walk around in Vrindavan getting everyone's love. Krishna said, sure. Madhu Mangal wore the yellow dhoti with a peacock feather and a flute. And that, unfortunately, you know, that was the day when Keshi came to Vrindavan. And Keshi thought that was Krishna. He started running behind Madhu Mangal because it perfectly fit the 
the recognition or the recognition criteria given by Kamsa Maharaj. So then Madhumangal helplessly ran behind Krishna and Krishna protected Madhumangal and killed Keshi. Keshi was the horse demon and he came in the morning and soon after that it is described that Narada Muni came to Vrindavan and in the Bhagavatam and in the Krishna book we can see Srila Prabhupada explaining that Narada Muni he said that O Krishna you have appeared in this world to destroy the demons and establish the religious principles so it's so it seems as if Narada Muni is actually glorifying Krishna but Narada Muni and Krishna by this point when Narada Muni is meeting Narada Muni and Krishna both kind of know each other's relationship so that it's almost redundant to tell Krishna why he has come because when Krishna is in Brindavan he forgets but when he meets an associate from outside Brindavan he looks into their eye and he can reciprocate to their bhav so Narada Muni is coming from outside from Mathura and in his eyes he is filled with concern for what's happening in Mathura so when he says this verse in the Bhagavatam oftentimes it seems as if he is glorifying Krishna but actually he is reminding Krishna please remember please try to introspect and ponder please try to contemplate what was the purpose of your advent you have come to reduce the burden of Mother Earth Jayatu Jayatu Devo Devaki Nanda Noyam you are the son of Devaki Jayatu Jayatu Krishna Vrishni Vamsha Pradipaha You are the lamp of the Vrishni clan Jayatu Jayatu Megha Shyamala Komalango Oh you have the complexion of a freshly formed monsoon cloud and very soft uh, texture of the skin Jayatu Jayatu Prithvi Bharanasho Mukundaha You have appeared to reduce the burden of Mother Earth So it seems as if it's glorification but it's actually reminding Krishna that step out of Brindavan Mathura really needs you you have come here to free Devaki and Vasudev. You have come here to knock the teeth off the mouth of Kamsa Maharaj. Please understand and stand up to your potential Krishna, stealing butter and yeah, playing the flute. You know, in the in the in the forests of Brindavan, that's one part of your pastime. But it's over now. You have to s step on to the next part. And when Krishna looked at into the eyes of Narada Muni, uh, Krishna had tears because he could see the concern of Narada Muni and Krishna remembered his parents in Vrinda, in Mathura how he had seen them during Advent although Krishna's eternal parents are Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj they are not Devaki and Vasudev but Devaki and Vasudev they had performed tapasya and desired Krishna's presence in their life over lifetimes and surely enough Krishna out of the kindness of his heart appeared to them in the prison house but very quickly transferred himself to Vrindavan so nonetheless, by the prayers of Narada Muni, uh, Krishna got reminded of his duty outside Vrindavan. And he decided, yes, I will go. Although it's heartbreaking, but I will go to fulfill the, the, the desires of Narada Muni and everyone in Mathura who's praying for my presence. In the morning, Keshi came, in the afternoon, Narada Muni. And in that evening, Akrura arrived in Vrindavan. Because Narad Muni was thinking, although Krishna has given me his word, he's going to go back associating with his Brajbasi friends and Brajbasi associates. And then they will have the last say in Krishna's decision making. So let me send another one. So he sent Akrura through Mathura. And Akrura came in the evening when his chariot, he arrived in Vrindavan. Akrura tried to convince Krishna but by then Krishna had associated so much with the Brajbasis, he was not ready to go. But then Akrura told Balaram, don't you want to go and see your parents? Because we have to understand that Balaram is the son of Rohini Devi and Vasudev Maharaj. That is Balaram's uh, connection to his parents. Balaram is the son of Rohini Maya and Vasudev. Vasudev is the father and Rohini Maya is the of course Devaki is the wife first wife of Vasudev but Rohini is the second wife uh, and Balaram is the son of Vasudev and Rohini so Akrura started telling Balaram that don't you want to free your parent your father is in the prison and Devaki is also like your mother you know you convince Krishna and Balaram said yes I want to see my father 
because <laughs> Balaram grew up uh, with Rohini Maya in Vrindavan and with Nanda Baba and Yashoda Rani. But Krishna grew up with Nanda and Yashoda, who are his eternal parents. So Balaram felt like going and seeing his father, and he told Krishna. And Krishna agreed. Krishna told all his Brajbasi friends and his parents that I need to go with Balaram. Balaram has to see his parents and I need to go. And it's not just a matter of one day. I can't just leave him there. I have to be with him and spend some time because I can't just take Balaram and he sees his father Vasudev Maharaj and I can't just bring him back. So I have to be with him. So I'll go and I'll be back in a few days. Now the description of Krishna and Balaram leaving Vrindavan and going to Mathura through Akrura is quite painful, so I will not get into those details. But surely enough, all the friends also came. They packed up their hmm, puller cards and they came to Mathura. And in a few days, Krishna sent all of them back, said, I will be there, don't worry. Now, as far as Mathura is concerned, everyone in Mathura is convinced that Krishna is the son of Devaki and not the son of Yashoda, including Akrura. Now, Akrura is convinced that Krishna appeared to Devaki and Vasudev, and that is just a temporary time being residence in this village of Brindavan, and now Akrura is doing his duty of reconnecting Krishna back to his parents. So nothing wrong from his side, he's not wrong. Those in Mathura are convinced that Krishna belongs to Devaki and Vasudev. Why? Because in the Rangashala, in the wrestling arena, uh, Krishna dragged Kamsa Maharaj and slammed him to death. Mercilessly fought Chanur and Mushtik and Kamsa was beaten up to death by Krishna in the presence of everyone. And at that time, everyone in Mathura remembered the aerial voice that they had heard many, many years ago, 11 years ago. Or in fact, even, you know, this was 11 and plus 8, so 20 years ago. <laughs> because Krishna lived 11 years. He was about 11 years when he came to Mathura. And Krishna is the eighth child, so there were miscarriages even before that. And there, were, uh, there was one miscarriage and there was killing of six babies. So a few years ago, the Mathura Vasis had heard the aerial voice during the, the wedding of uh, Devaki and Vasudev that the eighth son of Devaki will be the cause of death for Kamsa Maharaj. Now when they saw Kamsa being killed by Krishna, everyone was convinced, putting that aerial voice and the present situation together, that Krishna certainly is the son of Devaki. And he is not a Gopa, he is a Kshatriya. It so happened that he was there in the Vaishya Gopa clan in Brindavan, uh, but he is actually a Kshatriya, he is the son of Devaki and Vasudev. So everyone in Mathura is convinced including Akrura. And now it so happened that after Kamsa Maharaj was killed, King Kamsa was killed, Devaki and Vasudev were released and they were so happy to see Krishna and Balaram. Mother Devaki and Vasudev, they embraced the two boys. Vasudev Maharaj was remembering how Krishna was such a small child in the prison house when he actually took Krishna in the middle of the night across the Yamuna. And Devaki Rani was remembering all the circumstances where the kids were killed and how Krishna appeared in the middle of the night. And Devaki was so stressed that what's going to happen to him, how Kamsa is going to react. Now she's seeing her two children. But however, things didn't go good for Krishna. In, in the Shastra, there are specific age criteria for different castes as far as the threat ceremony is concerned. There's no threat ceremony for the Shudras as far as the Vedic um, path is concerned. When we talk about devotees and Vaishnava as well, that's a different discussion altogether. But we are talking just with respect to the bodily consideration of Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya and Shudra on the basis of uh, the Vedas. So the Brahmin thread is offered, or the, the, the sacred thread is offered to the Brahmanas, to the Kshatriyas and the Vaishyas. To the Brahmanas, it's at the age of eight. To Kshatriyas, at the age of 10. And to the Vaishyas, the Gopas, it's at the age of 12. So Krishna till now was convinced that he's a Gopa. He belongs to Nanda, 
and he belongs to Yashoda and he belongs to Vrindavan. This is what he was convinced about. And therefore, naturally, his age of the threat ceremony was 12. And Krishna was thinking, when I, I turn 12 in Vrindavan, I will have a threat ceremony done and my Nanda Baba will do all the services and all the ritualistic performances, including the fire sacrifice under Bhagori Rishi, who is the Rishi for Nanda Maharaj, Yashoda Rani and the whole family in Vrindavan. While for Vasudev, Devaki and everyone in Mathura, it's Gargacharya. So if you know Gargacharya from Mathura had come to Vrindavan to name Krishna. Where, however, with these numbers of the, the age criteria of 8, 10 and 12, the interesting twist in the tale is Krishna comes to Mathura and Vasudev Maharaj tells Krishna, Oh Krishna, you are actually a Kshatriya. You are my son. You are supposed to be the king in the future. You are not the son of Nanda Maharaj. You are actually my son. Oh Krishna, I was the one who took you across the Yamuna. And now you have come across the Yamuna yourself to your eternal parents. That's us. And everyone believes that. Everyone knows that. Devaki and Vasudev, they saw Krishna appear in the prison house, so they know. It doesn't go good with Krishna's heart <laughs> because it's almost a, it's a change of future. It's, it's the change of a future goal. It's, it's complete cut off from your previous past. Because Vasudev Maharaj tells Krishna that you're actually a Kshatriya. Your stay in Vrindavan and your association with Nanda and Yashoda was only temporary. You actually belong to us. So your threat ceremony won't be at 12 according to the Vaishyas. It is actually supposed to be at 10 according to the Kshatriyas. And you're already past 10. So now I want you to have a threat ceremony done. Not just you, you and Balaram, both my sons. Vasudev Maharaj is the father. So he's telling both my sons, I want you to have uh, your threat ceremony because both of you are Kshatriyas and both of you are past 10 years old now. So because you were in Vrindavan, there probably it was 12 for you, but you're not a Gopa, you're actually a Kshatriya. So I want you to have a threat ceremony done and then you can go to Gurukul and learn under great sages. So now Balaram is okay because Vasudev is actually his father and the rites are to be done by the father and also it's better to have one because at least the father is there. Devaki is not the mother, Rohini is the mother, Rohini is in Vrindavan. But Balaram is feeling well, the father represents the mother. But Krishna in his heart is thinking, for me, Vasudev is not my father, nor is Devaki my mother. Nanda and Yashoda are actually my parents. And how can I have a threat ceremony done in Mathura without my parents? So Krishna is thinking like this. And Vasudev Maharaj, he arranged for initiation, the, the Brahmin initiation, the thread ceremony sacrifice, the sacred thread offering for Krishna and Balaram. But then Gargacharya said, hmm, both mother and father must be present for both the boys. So Vasudev Maharaj is thinking, for Krishna, both are present, which is Devaki and Vasudev. But for Balaram, only the father is present, mother Rohini is in Vrindavan. While the situation is exact opposite, Krishna's parents are not there. Nanda and Yashoda are in Vrindavan. But Vasudev Maharaj is thinking, yes, Krishna's father is me, Krishna's mother is Devaki, so we are here. But as far as Balaram is concerned, I am the father, the mother is in Vrindavan. So I can get my wife, the second wife, Rohini. Gargacharya says both parents, mother and father must be there. So what does Vasudev do? Vasudev Maharaj writes a letter to Nanda Baba. And it's read out by Nanda Maharaj's younger brothers, saying that I have decided that our sons will have a Brahmin um, threat ceremony or sacred threat ceremony, according to the Vaishya uh, tradition, according to the Kshatriya tradition, because now they are in Mathura. And I would request if Rohini Devi can leave Brindavan and come with us to join us for the event in Mathura. Vasudev Maharaj is not calling Nanda and Yashoda because he's convinced they are not the parents. How much Krishna is going through in his heart? It's a tug of war of emotions of so many people thinking so many things. And what about Krishna's thoughts? What about Krishna's heart? 
So they read this letter. But then the question could be there, why is Rohini Devi in, in, in Vraja if her husband is in Mathura? Well, the logical reason is Rohini was pregnant with Balaram. So therefore, she had to be protected for Kamsa in Mathura. So she was kept under the care and affection of Yashoda Rani in Vrindavan. But now that Kamsa is gone, it's high time Rohini can reunite with her husband, Vasudev, in Mathura and preside over this whole um, sacred thread ceremony. So in the letter, Vasudev Maharaj writes that I, I would like my wife, Rohini, to come back to Mathura and be with our sons, Krishna and Balaram. As everyone in Brindavan hears this news, by the reading of the letter, they are heartbroken. The, the mirror of their heart is broken into millions and millions of pieces. And each of those pieces is sharp. And what is it broken by? It's broken by the, the stone. And what is the stone? The words of Vasudev Maharaj. It's like a stone which is breaking the mirror of the hearts of the Brijbasis into millions and millions of small pieces. That first they took Krishna and Balaram away. And now they are taking Rohini Maya away. Mother Rohini away. So everyone's heartbroken. And the one who's most heartbroken is Rohini Devi herself, that she has to leave Yashoda after so many years of separation. You know, separation from her husband. And she's been with Yashoda for so many years, and now she has to separate after that union. Rohini Devi in her heart has an emotional tug of war. I can't disobey my husband, Vasudev. I, I cannot be for the, the threat ceremony. But at the same time, how can I leave Yashoda? Yashoda also lost her son to Mathura. As I lost my Balaram to Mathura, Yashoda lost her Krishna to Mathura. And now I get to be united with my son, but Yashoda doesn't get to be with her son. So Rohini Devi is thinking, how can I obey my husband and preside over that sacred threat ceremony and also leave Yashoda Rani? She was almost praying to Brahmaji, can you just make a carbon copy of myself, another copy of my own body and send it to Mathura so that I can still remain in Vrindavan with Yashoda Rani while my duplicate copy can do the needful, preside over the different duties in Mathura. She comes to Yashoda Rani and Yashoda Rani embraces Rohini Devi. Yashoda Rani has a very big heart. You can imagine the mother of the Supreme Lord, who Krishna has the biggest heart and his mother. So you can imagine Mother Yashoda's loving heart. So Yashoda Rani tells Rohini Devi, you are my second body. There's no difference between you and me. Please go. You should go. Instead of both of us being here away from our children, if one of us can go, isn't that wonderful? This is the non-envious, uh, magnanimous heart of Mother Yashoda. She tells Rohini Devi, you are actually my second body. Please go. And if you don't go, I will be heartbroken. So to, if you want to keep me happy, you go on my behalf. You re represent all of us and take care of our sons. Rohini Devi agrees. An astrological chart was uh, calculated for the exact time to leave Brindavan to go to Mathura. Mother Yashoda packs up all the lunch boxes and the tiffin boxes to Rohini Devi and tells her, please eat on your way and also give my Krishna and Balaram something that I cooked. And everyone in Brindavan, they bid farewell to Rohini Devi with tears as she leaves Brindavan to go to Mathura to preside over the threat ceremony along with Vasudev Maharaj and Devaki Rani. Everyone in Brindavan cries in separation from Mother Rohini. Mother Rohini travels from Brindavan to Mathura. And as soon as she comes to Mathura, Krishna and Balaram, they offer obeisances at the lotus feet. They touch the lotus feet of Rohini Maya and they offer obeisances. Balaram is so happy. He touches the lotus feet of his mother. He embraces his mother because she is his mother. But what about Krishna? Yes, Krishna loves Rohini Maya. There's no doubt about it. But that second, to Mother Yashoda. So when Krishna offers obeisances and he touches the lotus feet of Rohini Devi, he is touching the lotus feet of Rohini Devi. But in his mind, 
he is actually touching the lotus feet of Mother Yashoda. When he embraces Rohini Devi, he feels the embrace of his mother, Mother Yashoda. Balaram is remembering his mother as she is, and Krishna is remembering his mother through the embrace, through the words, through the eyes, through the loving touches of Mother Rohini. He's actually feeling in his heart the absence of his mother, Yashoda. Devaki and Vasudev come to welcome Rohini Devi. And Vasudev is convinced, yes, Rohini and Devaki are my wives and Krishna and Balaram are my sons, complete family. What a tug of war with emotions on the proprietorship of Krishna. Not easy, not easy at all. So they come, Rohini Devi is welcomed by Vasudev and Devaki. And at that time Rohini Maya looks at them and looks at Krishna and Balaram and starts talking about Vrindavan to Krishna and Balaram to comfort them. And this goes on for quite some time. Even in this world we see sometimes when let's say we meet different kinds of people in one assembly and one kind of let's say culturally compatible friends they are talking in a certain language or they are talking with jargons that only they can understand so others feel left out in that assembly and that is what was happening with mother devaki rohini devi was looking at krishna and balaram and speaking about vrindavan and devaki rani would couldn't re relate to anything she couldn't relate to butter and she couldn't relate to walking barefoot and she couldn't relate to playing a bamboo flute and she couldn't relate to climbing on trees and, and, and eating fruits and uh, tucking your flute to the waist and jumping into a water pond. Why would a king do that, right? Why would a prince do all these things? And walking with cows, where are the, where's the umbrella? Where are the servants? Where's the fanning? Where's the royal uh, entourage? Devaki Rani couldn't relate to any of this. So she felt a little uncomfortable also in her heart that after a long time I've got my sons back. By speaking about that dairy farm Brindavan, it's possible that the two sons may run back to the place where we got them from after such a long time. So Devaki Rani was very uncomfortable. And immediately Rohini Devi understood. You see, this is culture. So much can be understood without saying a word. Just by looking at the expression and the emotions and the eye movements, so much can be understood. Vasudev was very happy that he was being the father and he was getting the chance to have Krishna and Balaram get initiated by Gargacharya in Mathura. And here all the mothers are talking. Balaram is very happy. He is missing Vrindavan, but he is happy that his mother is here. But our Krishna is left alone. Krishna left his parents, he left his home just to be with Balaram. Just so that Balaram can be with his father, Krishna was ready to leave his father. This is how much affection Krishna has for Baladev Prabhu, Balaram. So now here is the day of the initiation of the, the, the thread ceremony. And Krishna is sitting there, Balaram is sitting there. And Krishna is starting to realize and, and it's, it's almost starting to dawn in, in the horizon of his heart what's actually happening. It's not just accepting thread. It's not just accepting a thread. It's not just starting new education, fresh education. It's being without one's parents and complete change of identity. That's not your home anymore. This is your new home. That's not your caste anymore. This is your new caste. Those are not your family. This is your family. And Nanda and Yashoda are not your parents. Devaki and Vasudeva are. It's total cutting off his past, taking him away from his past and cutting off his, his, his past connection with Vrindavan and changing everything. Practically, that thread is going to change everything. He can't be a Gopa anymore. He has to be a Kshatriya and a king and follow Vasudev Maharaj's path of being a king. And most importantly, when Krishna is looking at Vasudev Maharaj, 
he's remembering Nanda Maharaj and he's thinking how Nanda Maharaj had spoken to Krishna in Brinda when Krishna was on the lap of Nanda Baba and Nanda Baba had told Krishna you know when you grow up that day will come when there will be a thread put around your shoulder you will be offered a sacred thread and Krishna as a child was clapping <laughs> without realizing what's going to happen and Nanda Baba was telling baby Krishna on that day I will do this I will do this I will do this and I will take care of you you will look so beautiful when you take Diksha from Bhagori Rishi in Vrindavan and Krishna now is shedding tears thinking all of that pleasure has been snatched away from Nanda Baba Krishna wrote a secret letter to Nanda Maharaj and he told him that Oh dear father, I know there was a letter that came from Vasudev Maharaj about the threat ceremony of your Krishna and Balaram. But I want to tell you something. I am not changing anything. I am your son. I am not anybody's son. I don't belong to any place except Vrindavan. I am not a Kshatriya. I am actually a Gopa. But here, I am doing this out of respect. So my request is, on the same day that I am having my thread ceremony done here, you please, O Nanda Baba, arrange for thread ceremony for all the boys in Vrindavan on the same day. Through Bhagori Rishi there, as I am taking my thread ceremonies, vows here through Gargacharya and Mathura, you please arrange for Sridam, Sudam, Subal, and all of my friends with whom I grew up, let them have the thread ceremony through Bhagori Rishi. And when Gargacharya will tell me to take vows, I will reply to Bhagori Rishi. <laughs> so it's almost like all the boys in the Gopa clan in Brindavan are getting their thread. But it's just that Krishna is in Mathura and, and Gargacharya is doing it on behalf of Bhagori Rishi. But Bhagori Rishi is my guru. Brindavan is my home. All my friends, we are all Gopas. Krishna wrote in the letter. I am not changing anything. Please do this for me. When I take my vows, do it for, please arrange it for all my friends too. And in this way, uh, I am not changing my caste. I am not changing my parents. I am not changing anything. I am still your Krishna. And he wrote this letter. And as the time came, Krishna shaved up. Krishna and Balaram shaved up to get their thread. And Gargacharya gave their staff, their renunciation brahmacharya staff, the danda. And Balaram's danda was straight. But due to some reason, Krishna's danda was a little crooked. <laughs> Everything about Krishna is transcendently twisted. Whether it's loving glancing, whether it's Krishna's form, whether it's Krishna's words, he, he says something, but there are layers and layers and facets of meanings hidden in those words and same goes with his danda and after the whole sacrifice was done as Gargacharya was doing the fire sacrifice and telling Krishna offer it into the fire the the oblation the the ahuti he was offering thinking that he's doing it in Vrindavan in front of Bhagori Rishi he was taking the vows as Gargacharya was asking questions but Krishna was answering as if he was answering to Bhagori Rishi battling emotions with every single thing in his heart and it's so interesting the level of sacrifice that the supreme lord can go through how much he can sacrifice his own personal pleasure his own home his parents his comfort he steps out of his comfort only to kill kamsa and when kamsa was alive everyone who was imprisoned was wanting to go home now that kamsa is killed Everyone who was a prisoner could go home, except one, that is Krishna, who was the cause of everyone's liberation. He can go home. And at the end of this ceremony, Gargacharya told Krishna and Balaram, now you should, you know, you should display your cloth, your begging cloth, and you should beg for alms, first from your mother, and then from everyone else. So Balaram went to Rohini Maya and said, Bhavati Bhikshan Dehi, please give me some alms. And Krishna is having tears. Hmm. Vasudeva Maharaj asked Krishna, is everything okay? Krishna said, yes. So why are you crying? Oh, it's just because of the fire. 
It's the smoke coming from the fire that's bringing in tears. But Krishna is thinking, where do I go now to get and beg alms from my mother? Where is my mother? I can't see Maya Yashoda here. While Devki Rani is just standing next to Krishna. Krishna is remembering his conversations with Mother Yashoda. Mother Yashoda had told Krishna when Krishna was a child that Krishna, when you get your Brahmin thread and when you come to me for arms and when you show me your little cloth and beg for arms, I will fill, Maya Yashoda had told Krishna in his childhood, I will fill your cloth with the most priceless, invaluable jewels from our treasure box. And she embraced Krishna. When that day comes, when you ask me, I will give all that I have to you. Krishna is remembering all that and tears are coming. That where will I go? That opportunity of Mother Yashoda offering arms has been taken away from her. Where will I go and beg? Thinking of this, not being able to please himself, and at the same time, he can't displease Devaki Rani. He took his cloth in front of Mother Devaki and he looked at her and he said, Bhavati Bhikshan Dehi, Oh Mother, please fill my cloth with arms. And as he said this, because of the constant struggle of emotions, Krishna fainted unconscious because he couldn't, he couldn't do it and he couldn't not do it. Seeing this, Devaki and Vasudev were not happy. They were thinking that I think Krishna is really missing that land of Brindavan. Hmm? He's missing his guardians, that he's not even able to be comfortable with his own parents. When Krishna is called Devaki Nandan, sometimes people ask this question, if Krishna is not the son of Devaki, then why we call him as Devaki Nandan? Srila Prabhupada actually explains this in the Bhagavatam. Dwe namni, Srila Prabhupada quotes, Dwe namni nandavharyaya Yashoda Deva Kiticha from the Puranas, saying that Mother Yashoda has many, many names. Many names. And one name is Yashoda, but another prominent name is Devaki. If Krishna has thousands and thousands of names and Radharani has thousands and thousands of names and Vishnu can have thousands and thousands of names, so why not the mother of Krishna, Mother Yashoda, having thousands and thousands of names? And of which the most prominent is Mother Yashoda, the name Yashoda. But after that, she is also popularly called as Devaki. Not to be confused with Devaki Rani of Mathura, Mother Yashoda is also called Devaki. So when we call Devaki Nandan, Krishna as the son of Devaki, from the Gaudiya Vaishnava perspective, that means that Krishna is the son of Devaki, meaning another name for Yashoda. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur in his commentary to the Bhagavatam has written, Srila <coughs> Chakravarti Pad in Asaratha Darshani Tika, he writes that I am not a snake, he says. What does that mean? You see the tongue of a snake, it's one tongue, but it's bifurcated at the end into two parts. So Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, so I am not a snake, meaning I can't share that one Krishna with two mothers. For me, the mother is Yashoda, says Chakravarti Pad. And even in Gopal Champu, we can write, see Jiva Goswami making a clear distinction about it. His Holiness Shivaram Swami Maharaj has also written about it in his book Damodar Janani. Very beautiful sections to read uh, at our own um, leisure time. So Devaki and Vasudev think now before Krishna runs away back to Vrindavan, you know, we have to do something. So they think that after his threat ceremony is done, we should offer him to a Vaishnav. And that Vaishnav should be very capable, uh, offer him to a teacher, please forgive me. We should offer him to a teacher who can teach him nicely. Shastra, who, in whose Gurukul Krishna and Balaram can learn. And then they will forget Vrindavan. They will get into their studious, scholastic part of their life of education and they will forget everything. This was the plan of Devaki and Vasudev to protect their sons out of paternal love and maternal love. Krishna and Balaram are discussing with each other whom should we learn from? Whom should we learn from? So one proposed, why not we learn from Narada Muni? So the other said, 
between Krishna and Balaram. The other one said, no, 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 no going to any Vaishnav guru. Because Vaishnavas, they can understand us. They can recognize that you are Balaram and I am Krishna. No going to any Vaishnav. And also, instead of teaching us, they will fall at our feet, recognize us and say, you are our Guru Krishna Mande Jagat Guru and we want to learn from you. So instead of going to a Vaishnav, let's go to a Shaivet. Let's go to a worshipper of Lord Shiva. Because then, because he's so absorbed in worshipping Lord Shiva, he may or may not recognize us. And naturally, out of the ease of his heart, he will have a nice, we will have a nice teacher-student relationship and we can learn and he can teach us. So of all the Shaivet gurus, they remembered Sandeepani Muni. This is how Krishna and Balaram uh, end up in the ashram of Sandeepani Muni. Because he's not a Vaishnav, he's a Shaivet, he's a follower of Lord Shiva. And Krishna and Balaram wanted at the, uh, a teacher uh, who can help them um, without any uh, mood of reverence. <laughs> Sandipani Muni had learned from Prabhakshetra and now had his ashram in Avanti, which was far away from Brindavan as far as foot is concerned, and from Mathura as far as foot is concerned, walking by foot. So Krishna Balaram thought to himself, we should go far away from Mathura. And at the same time, we should not let the Brajbasis know we are far away. Too many things happening here. Krishna and Balaram are talking to each other that Devaki. In fact, Krishna's thinking this in his mind. Please forgive me. Krishna's thinking in his mind. Devaki and Vasudev, they are very protective of me. And I have to get out of this place. Because if I stay here longer, it's possible, out of familiarity, I may be more inclined towards Mathura and forget Brindavan. So I want to go very far away from Mathura. Yet at the same time, if the Brajbasis get to know that I've gone very far away from Mathura, then they will not be happy. So I have to do something, Krishna and Balaram, together we have to do something by which we are far away from Mathura, remembering Vrindavan, but not letting the Brajbasis know that we are remembering Vrindavan. Hmm? We should not let them feel that we are in great pain, because if they get to know that we are in pain, they will also feel pain. They should not know that we have gone far away. They should still think we are in Mathura. So what did they do? What did Krishna and Balaram do? Balaram used to get bursts of remembrance of Braj because he used to remember his friends, his cows, Kiriraj Govardhan. He used to also remember Maya Yashoda. And in those times, Krishna used to have company. Krishna and Balaram are now brahmacharis. They are having a cloth under their uh, you know, belt, a tiger skin cloth. And they are having a stick, staff with a begging bowl, shaved up. They are thinking now hmm, what to do next. So Krishna and Balaram on the pretext of performing Puraschcharan. Puraschcharya means uh, in seclusion chanting a mantra a million times so that you develop a firm relationship with a certain mantra and have realization in the heart. So on the pretext of performing Puraschcharan or Puraschcharya, Krishna and Balaram, they tell all the Mathuravasi, so we are going to go in closed doors for a few months just to, after our Brahmacharya Diksha, to chant the mantra that Gargacharya has given. Uh, so don't search for us. And then as Brahmacharis, they sneak out in the middle of the night and they walk on foot from Mathura. Uh, they go to Avanti, which is the place of Sandipani Muni. Krishna and Balaram walk through villages. And as they walk through villages, Krishna remembers Brindavan. As they walk through villages, Krishna and Balaram see trees with flowers, they see rivers, they see mountains, they see cows, they see peacocks, they see deer, they see mothers playing with their children. And Krishna and Balaram remember Nanda and Yashoda. And at the same time, the boys are so beautiful as they are walking through different villages going to Avanti. Some girls also see them. <laughs> and they say that, oh, these two brahmacharis are so beautiful. After they graduate from their brahmachari ashram and they enter their grihastha ashram, some girl is going to be very fortunate. And Krishna closes his ears saying, I had heard all of these things from the lips of Srimati Radharani. Now I can't hear it from anyone. I'm a brahmachari. Krishna can't take it from anyone. And by foot, Krishna and Balaram walk through different villages, which all remind them of Brindavan, away from Mathura. 
to Avanti. And they finally reach the ashram of Sandipani Muni. Sandipani Muni is sitting on an asan, surrounded by many, many students. And none of the students get up because they realize that we are Brahmanas and they seem to be Kshatriyas. Their bodies are well built, they are Kshatriyas. So the Brahmana boys out of pride, they think we don't have to stand up and welcome them. They seem to be newly initiated. We are initiated for quite some time. And we are Brahmanas, they are Kshatriyas. We don't have to stand for them. So the students don't stand. But Krishna and Balarama dress so beautifully, amazing beauty. They are walking with firewood in their hand, offering it to Sandipani Muni. Sandipani Muni is looking at both of them and he's wonderstruck with the effulgence and beauty of these two boys. Shastra says that Vidnyanartham Sagurumeva Bigachet Samit Pani Shrotriyam Brahmanishtam. That when we offer and when we uh, when we approach a spiritual master, uh, we should offer firewood from our hand at his lotus feet. Hmm. Or at least we should carry firewood in our hand. Samit Pani. Pani means hand and Shamit means uh, firewood. Because firewood is used for you know yetnyas and bonfires by the Guru. So we have to take something that's useful for the Guru. Um, in the present generation, that firewood, that Shamit Pani could represent paper because that's a transformation of wood, which means we should take a notebook with us when we go to see our Guru in our hand to take down notes of whatever he speaks. And when they go, they offer the firewood at the lotus feet of Sandipani Muni and in a prayerful mood, Krishna and Balarama for obeisances, O oh, Master, O oh, source of all transcendental knowledge, please save us from the firing, blazing forest fire of this material world. We are drowning in the ocean of suffering. Please save us. Krishna and Balarama teaching, this is the way we approach Sri Guru. Not like we go to Sri Guru and say, Hi Guruji, what's up? How are you doing? This is not the way of approaching any um, superior. Sandipani Muni immediately accepts Krishna and Balaram and tells them, seems like both of you have very good culture. Your parents have taught you very good culture. And again, that's a thunderbolt of remembrance of Vrindavan and Nanda and Yashoda in the heart of Krishna. Sandipani Muni tells Krishna and Balaram, I will keep you here. And this time of your life is very crucial, extremely rare. It's meant for education. I will give you all the wonderful education, but for that, you have to be surrendered. Krishna and Balaram, they offer their life amid so much happening in Krishna's heart. Krishna has already sacrificed so much. There's nothing more Krishna can sacrifice. He has sacrificed his favorite food, his prasadam from Braj. He has sacrificed his mother, his father. He has sacrificed his friends. He has sacrificed his pastimes. He has sacrificed the Leela's Thalis. He has sacrificed the association of Srimati Radharani only to do good to the world. And now he's sacrificing his very life at the lotus feet of his teacher, Sandipani Muni. Dear devotees, this is the most important spiritual virtue of ready to sacrifice for the benefit of others. Krishna, as the greatest spiritual master, Krishna Vande Jagat Guru, says Adi Shankaracharya, that he is the guru of the whole world and Krishna is teaching us to speak Bhagavad Gita, to kill all the demons, to save mankind. How much Krishna went through, even in Vrindavan, how many demons he had to face, even outside, jumping from 88,000 miles, from a mountain top which was set on fire, fighting Jarasandha 17 times in Mathura. Dwaraka pastimes, so many demons, sacrificing everything just for the pleasure of others. This is the most important quality. Nothing pleases Krishna more than someone coming out of their comfort zone and sacrificing their time, their energy, their voice, their ability for the betterment of others. Krishna in the Gurukul, he sacrificed his life at the lotus feet of Sandipani Muni. Everybody would sleep comfortably, all the, all the students, but Krishna and Balaram, remembering Vrindavan during the cold nights in the Gurukul, hugging each other, they would be chattering with no cloth over them, 
just embracing each other, the warmth of each other's embrace, just to serve their guru. And all night talking about Vrindavan. And for Krishna, even when he went off to sleep, in the sleep, in the dream, he used to see Srimati Radharani and the gopis, and he's playing the flute. And when he would, his eyes would bring him back to reality, Krishna would give a sigh of grief that, was I actually in Vrindavan and mysteriously got now outside? Or am I actually here and was mysteriously transferred and transported to Vrindavan? Krishna performed so much Guru Seva there. So much happening in his life, but he was still sacrificing. He continued. His god brothers, the other students of Sandipani Muni would collect so many wood and firewood and so many other arms and Krishna would carry all of that. Krishna and Balaram would carry on their shoulder. Carrying wood, begging arms. Krishna and Balaram would go from one house to another begging. And the Grihasthas just looking at the fair complexion, dark complexion lords. They would offer everything. They would open their door and just give out everything. And they were the best students of Sandipani Muni. One time Sandipani Muni's wife, Guru Mata, asked, who are your favorites? And Sandipani Muni said, these two Kshatriya boys. Mata said, but I have never seen them serve. And Sandipani Muni said, hmm, they serve, but they hide and serve. They don't serve in public. Not in an ostentatious way to show everyone how much we are doing. They, they wouldn't do anything directly in the ashram. But whenever needed, they were there outside doing the real stuff. Guru Mata once realized that it's about to rain and we don't have enough wood. So who will go? And many boys refused that, oh, Guru Mata, by the time we walk, it's going to rain and everything's going to be drenched and it's not going to set fire. But Krishna and Balaram, without any excuse, soaking wet, they went. Always there. Firewood amidst a storm, all night long, soaking wet, chattering teeth in the middle of the forest. Sandipani Muni is saying, where are the two boys? Guru Mata said, actually, I, it's my mistake. I sent them, but I don't know where they are. I think they are in the forest. Sandipani Muni went next morning and he found Krishna and Balaram soaking wet with all the fire, the, the wood with them. And as they came back, all the boys laughed. We told you this is what's going to happen. But Krishna and Balaram did not use their mind in an analytical way to cancel out the possibilities of service. Although everyone was laughing, Sandipani Muni and Guru Mata felt so happy. They blessed Krishna and Balaram. Sandipani Muni touched his hand on the head of Krishna and said, I bless you, may all spiritual knowledge come to you. And all his life, Krishna, in his performance of his pastimes, he always said, even in his conversation to Rukmini later, that all auspiciousness in my life has come just by the blessings of my teacher. And this is so true. Whatever we get in our life is actually the kripa of great souls. And this is why Krishna tells Sudama also later in the Bhagavatam. Naham ijja prajatibhyam tapaso pashamane nava tushyayam sarvabhutatma guru shushrushaya yatha that I am not so pleased with the performance of uh, Brahmachari duties, Grihastha duties, Vanaprastha duties, or Sanyas duties, mm, or Brahmana duties, Kshatriya duties, Vaishya duties, or Shudra duties, as much as I am pleased by someone who can do Guru Seva and serve everyone mm, in a Krishna conscious way by personally sacrificing their self interest. Krishna has said this. And Sridhar Swami writes this in the commentary to that verse, that self-sacrifice in the matter of service to Sri Guru and the Vaishnavas, this is the backbone of all spiritual success. And we can see this not just for the day of Janmashtami, we can see this the day after Janmashtami is the appearance day of Srila Prabhupada. And we see this in the life of Srila Prabhupada also. Srila Prabhupada exemplified exemplified, absolutely exemplified as an Acharya, the spirit of getting out of his own comfort zone and sacrificing for the whole world. Srila Prabhupada was so comfortable at Radha Damodar temple at Seva Kunj as a sannyasi. It's like a dream plan that everyone's looking for. When I retire, I will be in, you know, <laughs> I will be in Vrindavan. Srila Prabhupada was there, but he gave it up, completely gave up everything sat on a cargo ship with two heart attacks, came and 
to the Western world with no money, no manpower, no contacts, nothing. And the single most spiritual virtue of self-sacrifice taught by Krishna on Janmashtami is continued by Prabhupada on Nandotsav the next day. Teaching all of us that our lives are meant to perfect for the self and for others. Janma sarthaka kari kara para upakar. We should be like candles, ready to offer service, constantly giving the light of the flame of our life, even if that means we have to melt ourselves. This material world, if you see, everyone is about taking from others for the self. What I lack, may I fill it through others' pocket. But amidst that, you see great souls like Srila Prabhupada and Krishna himself leading in this whole narration. Sacrificing everything of the self just for doing good to others. Rupa Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, living under trees with a kopin cloth, loin cloth, living off madhukari, begging prasad from others, eating once a day, sleeping two hours a day, and all day and night writing books that we are all benefiting from today. And on the other hand, a materialistic man, for his clothing, he is murdering animals slaughtering animals for his eating he's slaughtering animals for his car seat leather seat he's slaughtering animals so others must die others must suffer for my benefit and here vaishnava acharyas are ready to self-sacrifice themselves for others haridas thakur is being ready to be whipped and still telling everyone please chant the holy name so this is the most spiritual important spiritual virtue of self-sacrifice and on the day of Janmashtami or on the brink of Janmashtami, let us pray to Krishna. Krishna, your pastimes are very sweet. Your pastimes are also filled with a lot of opulence. But the section that we heard from, your pastimes also exemplify unparalleled sacrifice for this world. Please give us a drop of that. As followers of Srila Prabhupada, let us learn praying to Krishna let us beg for one drop of the spirit of ready to offer everything to others in all forms of service, connecting everybody to Krishna. Thank you very much. Vancha kalpatru bhyascha, krupa sindhu bhya evacha, patitanam pavane bhyo, vaishnave bhyo namo namaha, ananta koti gaura bhakta vrindaki jai. My prostrate obeisances to everyone who uh, helped me by participating and by blessing me with your prayers. Thank you. Hare Krishna, uh, Amrinder Prabhu. Thank you for the wonderful class. As usual, uh, we don't have to mention how you enlighten us with such spiritual wisdom. So would you have time for a couple of questions? Sure, uh, Prabhuji. We'll keep it to two because I yeah. have another class just after this. So we'll keep it to two. Yes, Prabhu. that's what I was thinking as well. So devotees, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand and then we would unmute you. And uh, yes, as Prabhu said, we would have time only for two questions. So Hare Krishna. So please feel free. Okay, there we go. We have Ria Ghosh Mataji. You can unmute yourself, Mataji. Hare Krishna Prabhu, Dandavat Pranam. Hare Krishna. Prabhu, how can we please Prabhupada? By the spirit that we just discussed, by preserving what he has given us and by sharing this fortune with others, by sincerely following the instructions of Srila Prabhupada, whether it is our sadhana, whether it is our seva, whether it is 100% uncompromising spirit of character, lifestyle, what we eat, how we dress, how we talk. Pleasing Prabhupada is a 24-hour activity. One thing goes off and then it's not a good painting. We have to paint every stroke, brush stroke properly. So every minute of the day is pleasing Prabhupada. How we speak, what, how we dress, what we talk, with whom we associate, what time we wake up, what time we go to sleep, what we do during the day. What we do when everyone's watching us, what we do when no one is watching us, how we associate with the outside world. Everything is pleasing Prabhupada. 
if we are following his instructions on the basis of his books to be Krishna conscious and to spread this message with everyone else. This is the heartbeat of Srila Prabhupada's mission. It's a preaching mission. It's a self-sustaining mission of preaching to the mind, becoming Krishna conscious and preaching to everyone else as good positive examples. Thank you, Mataji, for your question and Prabhu for your answer. We can take, I guess, one more question if anyone has a question. I guess uh, Prabhu's class was very clear and uh, crisp. That I think the, the I think it's the other way. I think it's I have put everybody to slumber in such deep sleep that. <laughs> <laughs> something that I'm really good at putting everyone to sleep. I, I think there's one question on the chat though. So it says, uh, it's from Karthik Kripa Prabhu actually. Would it be feasible to say that if we do not serve in the correct way and in the correct mode and deal with other devotees correctly, that he can also cause Krishna the same pain he experienced when having to leave his parents behind in Vrindavan? Yes, absolutely true. Practically um, very relatable. When on the pretext of service, when we end up being bad examples, when we don't talk properly, sometimes it's possible out of the stress, let's say of a festival, it's possible that we don't deal with others properly. We could be harsh. And again, all of this I'm saying from my uh, personal introspection. Um, I have I have done that, I have seen that, I have felt regret in my heart about it, and I'm sure we all feel that too. Um, when we do that, when we are bad examples, then we actually cause harm and we cause Krishna pain because there are so many examples where simple, sincere-hearted people come to the temple and we shout at them, we yell at them on the pretext of following a certain rule, we break another rule of misbehaving with them. You know, we don't talk to them properly. And what happens is we have turned them away from Krishna permanently because they go away with that impression that, oh, if this is how devotees are behaving, I don't want to be a devotee. So what's happening is that person could have been a devotee and by our wrong conduct, we have taken them away from Krishna. So certainly it's the pain in Krishna's heart of being separated from his devotees. Thank you, Prabhu. Uh, we very much needed uh, an answer and uh, you've given it in such a wonderful way. So once again, Prabhu, thank you so much. Thank you. So and much. Uh, uh, you've been so kind that, you know, uh, you've felt that the other devotees also should uh, speak. So tomorrow, unfortunately, we won't get the chance to hear from you, but we will be hearing from you on Srila Prabhupada's Yasa Puja. And we really look forward to that. Uh, so I'll just go ahead with the announcements regarding the following sure. programs. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much. Hare Krishna. So, devotees, as you all know, sorry about that, I'm just sitting outside. So, we have Kirtan at our temple. This is our pre Janmashtami Kirtan. Uh, it's already on. You can follow us on our Kirtan Atlanta page or ISKCON Atlanta page, and you can see the Kirtan going on live in the temple hall right now. Uh, we also have devotees from New Orleans who have come. So we are very thankful to them for their amazing kirtans. But kirtans will go on probably for the next two hours. So please join in and uh, experience the joy of kirtan as we move into the Janmashtami and absorb ourselves in the holy name of the Lord. And as you all know, tomorrow is the most auspicious appearance day of Sri Krishna, Krishna Janmashtami. We have events all day starting from Mangala Arti at 4.30 a.m. Then we'll have a regular morning program with the morning Bhagavatam class by Her Grace Gita Mataji. And then we'll have Darshan Arti because they addressing the deities takes a little more time on Janmashtami and festival days. And then we'll have programs throughout the day. We also plan to go on Harinam to the park. Hopefully if the weather is all right, we can do that. Uh, we'll have evening Artis, Kirtans, We'll have classes by His Grace Shambhihari Prabhu, His Grace Adi Gadadhar Prabhu, and His Grace Vedasar Prabhu at 11 p.m. Uh, Abhishek Kirtan, all these will be broadcasted live on Zoom and on Facebook. So please be sure to join us for these programs. 
the following day is the Vyasa Puja of Srila Prabhupada. So we are finalizing the schedule. We will be sending out details soon. We should probably have a morning Bhagavatam class by His Grace Ad Amarendra Prabhu. So we will be sending out the schedule soon. Please stay tuned for updates on that. Uh, speaking of updates, you can go on to this link tree page and access our website, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, WhatsApp, all with just one single click. So please feel free to go and follow us on all these platforms to stay up to date with all our programs. Moving on. So prayers. Uh, we want to pray for the health of His Holiness Jayaptak Maharaj, His Holiness Amala Bhakta Swami, who is somewhat serious right now. Her Grace Govardhan Leela Mataji. And uh, also the devotees of New Orleans who uh, are under threat of uh, the hurricane. So please pray for all of them, the doctors who are helping to fight COVID and also those who we haven't been able to mention. Also Uttama Radhika Mataji as well uh, for her speedy recovery. So let's chant the Hare Krishna Mahamantra three times along with the darshan of our deities for today. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Once again, we thank all of you for joining us for our programs on a regular basis. Uh, you can tune on to our Kirtan Atlanta page where we'll be we are already having Kirtan at the temple. So please join us for some amazing Kirtan as we head into Sri Krishna Janmashtami. Hope you, all of you have a wonderful Janmashtami and Sri Prabhupada Vyasa Puja and please join us. Hare Krishna. <laughs>